I joined the atomic clock work just after it had started operating. People always want things more accurate. If you improve the accuracy, it may not be apparent immediately, but somebody will come up with a use for it. People uh, found that by using quartz, which is a piezoelectric material, um, if you press it, it distorts and produces an electrical charge. And if you provide um, a valve circuit or some means of overcoming the losses, you can maintain this in oscillation. They take various forms, either a plate or a, um, a circular disc or a bar, and Essen's work, Dr. Louis Essen, who joined NPL in 1929, his first work was working and improving the ring oscillator, where the quartz is in the form of a ring, about eight or ten centimetres in diameter. It had previously been set up by a Dr. Dye, and this ring was supported on three pins, but by further investigation, Dr. Essen found that if you supported it on three silk rings to make it work in a circumfer circumferential um, movement, it provided a very stable oscillation. Put it in an oven and that became the working standard in many of the national observatories around the world. Atoms are very fundamental. They are unaffected by temperature and pressure and barometric effects, whereas the pendulums and the, um, the oscillatory mechanism in a watch is affected by temperature. So atoms are very basic, and that is the reason why atoms, um, or in the case of America, they studied molecules first, but we at NPL and the vision and foresight of Dr. Essen decided that the way forward was with atomic um, units um, in order to form the basis of the atomic clock which he, uh, he projected. But these are the original research papers done by Norman Ramsey, Rabi, Millman and Cush in their experiments uh, on um, exploring atoms. This was done pre-war and written up for the journals. And this formed the basis of the theory at which we managed, or which Essen and his team managed to produce the atomic clock. Dr. Essen and Mr. Parry, Jack Parry, they were the two principal scientists which were allocated to the project in about 1953-54 and uh, they did the original design work for a piece of apparatus which was made in the workshops at NPL. Um, that piece of apparatus was set up in a room, a special room devoted to, to the purpose, and eventually got working in May 1955. Atoms are, of course, the basic thing which we start with, and the cesium atom is in the alkali group of metals, and their characteristic is that they are monovalent, they have a centre nucleus and a valency electron which orbits the nucleus. This valency electron spins, and it can either spin with the nucleus or against the nucleus. If it spins with a nucleus, it gives the atom a high energy, and the converse is true if it spins against the, new at against the nucleus, 
the atom is in a low energy state. So the apparatus consists of a, a tube, an evacuated tube with an oven. We load the oven with cesium metal, which looks very much like mercury, and heat it uh, to about 80 or 100 degrees C. So a stream of cesium atoms are boiled off down the tube to a detector at the opposite end. On the way down the tube, it passes a first deflecting or focusing magnet. And then in the centre section, there's the very important part called a cavity, which is where the action takes place. And we feed this cavity with 9,200 megahertz of electrical energy. The atoms react with this applied magnetic field and they flip either from their high energy state to the low or vice versa, and the second magnet refocuses those that have undergone the change onto a detector at the far end. So we have the exciting oscillator feeding this cesium cavity. That comes from a quartz oscillator. We take the signal from the detector, alter it and make it suitable by means of a servo system and feed it back to correct the frequency of the exciting oscillator. From that oscillator, more synthesizers, we come to a distribution system where we can distribute uh, standard frequencies, including our one pulse per second tick. It was exciting because it was never heard of before. And it was exciting because we um, to find uh, the operating point, looking for the resonance, as it is called, um, we had to search, very much like searching for a needle in a haystack. Uh, the problem was we didn't know what the needle looked like. Uh, if you're in a haystack and a needle, you know what you're looking for. But eventually they found it and it was announced. And um, a tea club where we all met to discuss uh, matters was rapidly told that they'd found what they thought was the resonance and we all went over to see it. And within a matter of a, a month or so, the value had been published and details in the press of the um, accuracy with which this new atomic clock uh, could operate. And of course, as occasion occasionally op uh, happens, uh, the press exaggerated things and added a zero or two to the number of... Um, years of which it wouldn't gain or lose a second but the true value of our first clock was about an accuracy of about one second uh, in um, in 300 years the job he was engaged on when i arrived was measuring the velocity of light which he did by using um, a cavity and measuring the radio frequency at which it oscillated under controlled conditions, of course, using the frequency standard from our quartz clocks. That experiment um, produced a result which was 16 kilometres per second higher than the accepted value at that stage, which is quite a big distance, or quite a big error, of course. But he rechecked everything and reset the experiment using different materials and different circumstances and verified that his version, 16 kilometres per second faster, was the true value. And that result uh, is now a fixed value. It has been improved in accuracy, but the basic number is correct. And having that knowledge, and later knowledge of the atomic second gives us very accurately the length of the meter. He was always very friendly. Um, for example, we lived only a few hundred yards uh, from each other and occasionally, or quite frequently actually, we used to cycle to work across the park. We'd meet up and we'd chat then as we uh, cycled into work. He was very generous with young staff and would explain things to them. I can remember quite a few times I came to him with a problem and he would um, reach across the desk, get a piece of scrap paper and start writing some figures down or equations down. 
And um, I'm not very good at that sort of thing, and I, I had to admit that I wasn't. But he would go back a stage or two and explain it fully until I uh, had grasped the situation and we knew where to uh, go on the, uh, on the next problem or whatever it was we had under discussion. He generated these ideas. Um, some of them fell by the wayside or we said, well, that's not going to be practicable or that cannot be manufactured or we can't do that for uh, some weeks. We, we don't have facilities available. But it was his foresight that enabled us to make progress, quite rapid progress in, uh, in many cases. Cesium is the uh, favoured material throughout and um, clocks of various types have been uh, developed since, particularly at NPL. Everybody likes something to be more accurate, I think. Navigation is the principal um, application. Present day um, accuracy can, using GPS can get your position defined anywhere on the Earth's surface to within a, a metre or so. Communication, everybody is into communication, broadbands, fiber optics, the bandwidth they need to increase and in order to define the bandwidth correctly, you need accurate frequency standards worldwide. If you can increase the accuracy a little bit more, there's always somebody that will come along and say, ah, I've got an idea, I can now use that um, increased accuracy.